Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat, Food for Thought. And uh, this week we are going to be covering how to hire a butcher. Ah, working with a butcher. Yeah, it's, it's fall and mm -hmm. there's a lot of people, definitely some people processing their own meat, but a lot of people raising their own meat or buying Right. sides in and have been asking us questions about how to work with a butcher, how to hire a butcher, how to get, have our meat cut up to where mm -hmm. it's useful in the household. Right. So we're going to talk about how to hire a butcher today and how to have your meat uh, cut up. Absolutely. But <laughs> let's catch up um, for a minute. Yeah. It has been a hectic season. It's been really hectic. You can see we're back down here in the harvest kitchen and uh, that's because it is cold outside. It's not freezing out at the moment, but it has definitely turned to fall here. We had a big storm come in. Yeah, a lot of you caught that. We were we were supposed to get hit really hard, <laughs> and we didn't yeah. other than some hard freeze. Yes, areas around us got hit with a lot of snow. Oh, they did. Yeah, Montana, our friends in Montana, yeah. I know a lot of you guys got hit really hard. We heard stories of people yeah. losing their gardens and just really yeah. having a lot of trouble with this unseasonable storm. Right. And so uh, feel for all of you out there that went through that. Uh, we certainly went through a rush preparation and got a lot of things mm -hmm. into the house that wouldn't normally come in until kind of spread out through the month of October. Yeah, we kind of like took all of harvest season and squished it into a week or About two. About a week. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, well, a week of bringing it in. It's been really busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it's still being put up. You're still, I mean, there's gonna be another yeah. week or longer just of- To get through everything. Uh, getting through a lot of the apples, tomatoes. Yeah, I still have baskets of pears, I have all the yep. green tomatoes. I still have a lot to do. Yeah, you made so, a lot of progress though, you're doing great. Yeah, we've gotten a lot put up and it's really exciting. A lot of really delicious things. The new thing for me this year that I am super excited about is we have some really good crab apple oh, trees. Oh man, yeah. And um, I just did a spiced pickled crab apple. Oh, these, they're so good. They're like spicy and tangy and sweet. Oh, and oh they're, they're bright wonderful. red. They're so gorgeous. And, it, and if you didn't see it, check out the video we posted yesterday. I did a little tour with Carolyn right. in the kitchen on kind of a, a normal harvest day where she was dealing with those crab apples yeah. and, and a lot of other things. So it's a little short one, but really fun. Yeah. Just uh, right in there where things were happening. You guys were getting Doing a lot all of that. that. Done. And right in the middle of that, I'm excited because I am filming a training for you guys <laughs> on making tomato soup. Oh meal wow. can canning tomato soup not just making it but canning tomato soup so I'm really excited about and, getting to share that one. and that's part of a, that's kind of a free training that's a canning yeah. training not right. just tomato soup but canning mm -hmm. training yeah. that uh, is a workshop that's also going to have a discount yeah. uh, to the canning class if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with that if you guys haven't heard about that canning class that, that uh, we released this year yeah I'll post a link you can go check that out but uh, also be looking for this free training coming out in the next few weeks yeah so yeah. that'll be fun I get to film that today All right. <laughs> some of it very, very cool very yeah cool. what have you been up to oh wow well <laughs> <laughs> today I was harvesting radish seeds harvesting sunflowers radish seeds cool. yeah had the boys harvesting the beans that we left on the vine okay. for seed. Right. And we've been working in the barn, getting the barn ready yeah. for winter. This is the first year we have had an actual barn. Now, it was more of a pole barn, if you guys know what that is, just a structured building, not an animal barn. So we are mm -hmm. remodeling it, converting it, at least part of it this year. It's going to take several years to do this, but right. into an animal barn. So working a whole lot on that. And so most people remodel their homes, but when you're a homesteader, before you remodel your you home, remodel the you barn. remodel the barn and the garden <laughs> and the pasture. <laughs> we'll get to the house later. Eventually, <laughs> it's a good house. And uh, yeah, and just the dealing with all the leftovers of that very fast harvest. Yes, very and, fast. And of course, you're really doing the same inside. Mm -hmm. Just. Mm -hmm. Just picking up Working all the pieces. Away. Yeah. 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 So lots of fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, and we just made grape wine from our own grapes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really Couple exciting. We've never been able well, to do it's, it it's from Well, it's brewing. Home. We haven't had it yet. No, right. It, so it, it's, it'll be several it's months. Just got started. Age, but but that's yeah, really exciting. Yeah, it was cool. We had enough grapes for, for what two and a half gallons, I think. I think it was about yeah, two and a half. Yeah. So that'll be fun to see how that turns out. Fun thing to try. Yeah. And. 
Good. Well, let's get into a couple okay. questions so we can jump into main topic today. And uh, the questions are from the chicken video we butchered. Did you guys catch that? Okay. Over 200 chickens in a day our family did uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure some of you saw the video on that. If not, uh, we'll put it at the end of this video. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a crazy busy, exciting day. Got a lot done. It went really well. Had some great help. And we've got a couple questions here. Um, from Joe S. I would like to know what you do with any roosters. Are they used strictly for broth? Ah. And in a conventional setting with older roosters, maybe that have been with the hens right. for years, yeah. we would almost definitely use those for broth. Yeah, we, we've had a few roosters that were older roosters and were yeah, tough. when it's time for they them to go. They were tough yeah. birds, that's, and that's even bad. I have simmered those things for hours, and they're still tough, so they become great yeah. for broth. But when you're raising meat chickens, right. you can order full runs of roosters. Mm -hmm. uh, we order mixed batch is mm -hmm. the way we usually do it. And so, yes, there's a lot of roosters in there, but they're young. They grow fast, and they're very young. So, um, so they're great they're, for, they're roasting great for roasting birds, yep. frying birds, for anything. They're very tender moist and juicy right. so yeah. they're they just get uh used just like anything else in this context yep don't have to worry about that with with these meat birds uh -huh. let's see here another good question by derek chetty how do you deal with fly control and a few people ah. commented that they didn't see a lot of flies mm -hmm. and you're right there weren't many uh, is this specific to the chicken butchering? Because is, we do have flies. We are a homestead. And well, there are flies. We do, but there's an overall fly control strategy, and yeah. then there's a fly control strategy for for when we're butchering. Right. And uh, so this was in context to the butchering. And okay. so, first of all, on the farm, we work really hard to not have an accumulation of material that's going to really bring the flies in. They right. come no matter what. We have animals, we have poo, and so we have flies. Yeah. But by mixing that with carbon, composting, uh, different strategies, we really try to thin out and reduce the fly population. And, well, and the meat chickens are a great example of that because we have them in tractors and those tractors get moved around right. pretty much daily. And so that just spreads that out, which allows it to dry out really quickly and doesn't bring in the flies. Well, and it just, it actually absorbs into the ground in the right, areas where we've been ground. within a few weeks, right. green up real nicely. Yeah. And so there are strategies on the property just to reduce fly control. And, and one good rule of thumb is that whether it's in the pasture, in the barn, if it smells, if it smells like urine or poop, you've got a problem, you've got a problem yeah. and we need to be adding carbon to that situation, which is going to help decomposition, which is going to help lower your fly population. So that's strategy number one. Right. Strategy number two is that we try to butcher as late in the season as possible. I know a lot we of do. folks get started really early and then uh -huh. they're butchering in the heat of the summer. We have not liked the flies or particularly the wasps and the yeah, meat bees the meat that come bees. with butchering in midsummer. Yeah. So we try to wait till we've had some good frosts and the season cools off a bit and that really reduces the fly population as well, as so well as the wasps. For us, that's usually mid to late September, mm -hmm. even yep. into October. And we find that that does a couple things. One, it really helps with that pest population, but yep. two, it also allows us to bring chicks in later into the summer when the weather is really warmed up and we have avoided all sorts of health problems with those chicks because they're not fighting that cold. You're not having to really fight with those brood lights and make sure you've just really got them in there and protect them from all sorts of spring it, it weather. It just makes for an easier job. We don't have it to does. be as fussy yeah. on that side. Right. So we like that strategy. Yeah. Great, good questions, you guys. And um, let's get on to main topic since we're talking about uh, butchering and processing animals. Okay. Which is how to hire a butcher and how to have your meat cut and wrapped for your household for best use. Okay. Absolutely. And we know that journey and, yeah. and that is a journey to learn what works best for you. Uh-huh. So hiring a butcher. Hiring a butcher. Well, you know, before you even are hiring a butcher, honestly, you got to find the animal. Right. If, if you're, you're not, not if raising you're not it raising yourself, them yourselves, you need to find something to get butchered. <laughs> well, absolutely, and we sure want to encourage you if you don't have the ability to raise something yourself to be supporting your local farmers, mm -hmm. buying good quality meat, and so that means you need to find somebody to buy from. Right, which is often going to be 
a local rancher, hopefully, mm -hmm. if you're talking um, large animals, sometimes a uh, farmer, you have farmers locally that does some chickens. I, do you feel like all of a sudden the flies just came out now that we've talked about controlling flies? <laughs> we, like all of a sudden <laughs> three flies ended up buzzing around. We definitely have a few. <laughs> that happens in the basement down here sometimes. But um, so you want to look for your local farmer or rancher. And mm -hmm. good, good places to find that is to go to your local farmer's, farmer's market, market and yep. start asking around. They may not be there with packages of meat. Some places they are, some places mm -hmm. they aren't. But go start asking other vendors, do you know who sells meat? Well, and the value too of buying your meat in bulk, buying a half or a whole animal mm -hmm. is much more cost effective. Oh, much cheaper than cut and wrap meat, mm -hmm. you know, from the farmer's market. That has to be USDA certified, stamped, right? and it just has to have a higher cost to it. So if you want to find good quality meat for yourself, mm -hmm. then you need to go find somebody that's growing it that will sell you the animal. Right. And, or a part of the animal. A lot of times you can partner different people, you just have to find the resources that you have. Different people do it differently, but often you can buy a quarter to a half to a whole animal mm -hmm. and then have it cut up for you. Right. And that is a great way to get high quality meat mm -hmm. at a lower cost and to have your pantry stocked up. Right. And well stocked for the season. Yeah. So the way this process often works is that you buy the animal alive from the rancher, right? Mm -hmm. Buy them alive from the rancher. And then you're going to work separately with a slaughter person or a kill guy who's going to come. What is, is there a technical it, 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 name it, for him? Uh, this can be different. Well, he, different yeah, places. different different slaughter guy, kill guy, and it's it's going to work differently. You're mm -hmm. you're the guy, the person that you work with that you buy the meat from. You want them to really help you out. Oh, and, and they should help and you. coordinate either either having the kill person come out to their farm to harvest the animal and take it to the butcher shop for you or in some places you don't have that mobile slaughter mm -hmm. and so you the farmer will take it to the butcher shop for you okay. and they slaughter it there and then you will often pay for those fees you'll pay the the the, far, the rancher one fee, you'll pay possibly the slaughter if it's a mobile slaughter one fee and then you'll take it over and work with the butcher. Now most of the times this can be done really seamlessly where you never have to see any of it you don't ever see mm -hmm. the animal until it shows up in little white packages ready yeah. for your freezer. Yeah. So usually you can get that coordinated amongst themselves really easily. And often they already have a, um, a program working together. You know, the rancher already has the slaughter guy he works with who recommends a butcher. If you want, if you haven't done this before, you want to try to work with somebody that does have a nice system yeah. and it's going to make it as easy as possible for right. you. Yeah, and so, um, then it's going to go to that butcher mm -hmm. and sometimes they're going to have a butcher to recommend. Sometimes you have to find a butcher and step one is finding a good butcher. Right. And we have had a lot of butchers over the years besides processing our own meat. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the most important factor is somebody that is flexible to work with you that will yeah. both help train you and help work with you for specialty cuts. Because when you get into making the most of everything, mm -hmm. when you get into homestead living and how you wanna have things cut up, um, you're gonna find over years that you get different opinions and you want something that's gonna really work with you. And they are out there. Usually they're a smaller outfit. The, right. the bigger outfits, they just kinda run like a machine and they wanna put you through the standard cut, do their thing, and they don't want a lot of fuss. Right. And if you're gonna make really good use of everything and tailor your cut to your household, yeah. then you need somebody you need that's flexible. Work with you. And, and that might yeah. take a few years of trying one guy or another guy, but that's really, really important. And also the integrity of making sure you get your own meat. That's what I was gonna that, say. That's another that's... issue. If you're going through the trouble to yeah. either raise your own meat or find a good producer that's raising quality meat that you have confidence in, you need to have a butcher that you trust mm -hmm. that makes sure you're gonna get your meat back because some outfits, they'll mix the ground meat up. It, it, it's just not good. And that's that's not why we're doing of this. Of course, so, that happens more when you get to a larger um, processing you, place usually, that has yeah. the tendency to happen more yeah. because they have more animals coming in and out. Mm -hmm. If you're working with a small butcher who maybe is only getting your animals in for a day, then you have the less likelihood that that's right. going to happen. So know your butcher. Yeah. And you know, do the best you can. Get started. Try one. 
Um, they should treat you respectfully. They should be willing to help you figure things out and not be short or, or really bossy around. And some can be. They can be very much treat you like you're, like you're not too smart. And you want somebody that's patient and going to work with you because as you do this over a few years, you're going to learn how to tailor the way you have that animal cut up to best meet your needs, which we'll talk about here in just a second. And so you want that flexibility. Also to make the use the most use of the animal. Yes, yeah. So when you get your animal to the butcher, however that happens, you have a lot of decisions to make all of a sudden. You've they're, got a lot of questions They're gonna to ask you a lot of questions. About what kind of meat cuts you want back. Do you want a lot of ground beef? Do you want steak? Do you want roast? What kind of steak? What kind of what steak? Kind of roast? You know, if it's a pig, do you want bacon? Do you want ham mm -hmm. that's been cured for you? There are a lot of different options that you're gonna have to make a decision about. Right. And that can be overwhelming. If it's a first time and you're, oh, you know, you're used to like going to the grocery store and buying single cuts at a time for specific meals. Remember the meals. first time they asked us that? And, and then, I was like, well, yeah. I don't know. I have yeah, no, idea. no idea. I just what I want. Just want some hamburgers, some steaks, some roasts. Some meat. <laughs> right. And so there's your answer. Most of those guys will have a standard cut list. Whatever the animal is, they will have a standard cut list. That's the best place for you to start. Yeah, if it's the you least don't confusing, know what you want. Yeah. And you just get the standard cut list and take it as they you know, as they give it to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than weights, you might have to say you want one pound packages, two pound packages for certain things, but just ask them to go as simple as possible and keep it as standard as possible if it's your first round of this. Right. Okay. By doing that, you will realize after the first season of mm -hmm. using the meat, what you used a lot of, what you didn't use a lot of, what worked for your household. Do you, are you gonna do more steaks? Do you want more roasts? Do you want more ground meat? Right. And you've got a lot of perspective on that. We've done different things over the years and even you know some years are different than other years and what you want in the household and in the freezer. So Some years have been very different for us. Some years we have a wood burning cook stove where I can make big roast meals really easily without using any extra energy. And so I want a lot of roasts and maybe not so much ground. Other years Which we don't have. we have coming have, online this year. This year we have so. a lot of roasts, yeah. Um, and other years we don't have that capability and I want more ground meat because I'm gonna be quick cooking something or more meat loaves or burgers or something of that right. sort. So it really has to be tailored to the situation. But, um, as you get that standard cut list and you start using that, you're gonna find yourself going, gee, I'm going through my whatever it is really fast. I'm going through my ground beef really fast. And um, you know, one trick here is that you do have to budget it out. You mm -hmm. have to budget your different cuts out because it's not a grocery store with an endless supply. Right. You've got what you've got in your freezer and you have to use it all. But um, you'll find yourself realizing, you know, next year I really wish that I could get more ground beef or I really wish we could have more steaks for summer barbecues. Well, and your family. Or whatever it right. is. So we love steaks, but mm -hmm. steaks are a luxury even when we're raising our own meat. Right. Um, they're more work to prepare. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just a, a luxury in that area compared to ground beef or roasts. Mm -hmm. And so we find ourselves some, some years going with very little steak, some going with a little more because we'd like to have a few. But um, other things like hamburger, you're, you can prepare a lot of different things really easily. Mm -hmm. Roasts kind of in the middle, but a lot of it depends on your own family. Right. And your own cooking style. Yeah. Do you make a lot of stews? Mm -hmm. Do you have more meat, potatoes, veggies type mm -hmm. meals? Uh, or a mix of all of that. And that's gonna really determine how how, how, how that cut, cut list Absolutely. works yeah yeah so going you're never going to be able to go with somebody else's cut list and have it ideal for your family right that's why the standard cut is going to give you kind of a little bit of everything and you're going to be able to um just tailor that in the following years that you that you right. go through so we're talking you and i keep defaulting to beef when we're talking about this well that's an easy one to talk it's about, an easy but, one to talk about. But lamb's the same mm -hmm. you know pork is the same and there's a few different things in pork like your bacons and your uh, and your hams and whatnot mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of years with pork we end up doing almost entirely sausage because mm -hmm. we can use uh the italian sausage just yep. in spaghettis we just find ourselves using that ground meat 
lot well, and it's, like that. And it's really the same with beef. We do a lot. We, we're mm -hmm. heavy. When it comes to a standard cut, we're heavy on burger. On burger, burger. Yeah. We like hamburgers, and burgers are just easy to make big meals for yeah. a large family. That burger goes into, you know, stews and meat pies and spaghettis and all kinds of things right. really easily. And if you need to make your meat really stretch, hamburger is a great way to go because you can always add things to it, like beans, shredded zucchini. I, even the kids don't know when I've added a whole bunch of shredded zucchini to, to burger sauteed in a pan for a taco filling or anything right, like not that. Not for hamburgers, but not for, for the hamburgers, fillings. but for a yeah. filling of any sort. You you just can't tell that it's been beefed up <laughs> with, <laughs> with something else in there. So that can really help you use a little bit less meat and make it stretch a lot further. So let's talk about a few items um, outside the normal cut list okay, yeah. that you want to try to take advantage of. And um, one of those are the entrails, the, the um, I'm awful. sorry, the, the <laughs> awful offal, um, your heart, mm -hmm. your liver, your kidney, right. your tongue if it's a beef. Mm -hmm. I think we've even done tongue from the pork, which has been great. Sheep and pork. Sheep and right? pork. Sheep mm -hmm. are kind of small, but but it's all good meat. <laughs> Same with the cheek meat. Yeah. Good meat. Um, you want a butcher that will work with you on those things yes. because otherwise that stuff's gone. They're either going to take advantage of it or it's getting thrown it's away. It's going to get dumped. And I know for both you and I, it's really important to try to use as much of the animal as possible. Right. And... Um, for one, there's just huge amounts of nutrition that are getting thrown away when you're throwing away the awful. Right. Um, but for two, you know, it's just being the best stewards of something that we've taken possession of or we've raised um, by using all right. of that. But if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. Right. The, the standard default is that most people don't want those things. They don't want to see them. And so standard, it's just going to get tossed and, and so don't be afraid of those yeah. ask for them and figure out how to use them and you'll you'll have to play around with it uh, we love lengua tacos tongue uh -huh. tacos those are great same with the cheek meat and uh -huh. some of the animals uh the hearts fried up in butter and salt and garlic and salt. is so it's good wonderful it's very rich it's it's yeah. very good uh same with the livers she has yeah. got a great way that she does liver yeah that works really well and uh, so don't let those things go you've paid for that animal mm -hmm you want to use as much of it as possible and so again you want a butcher that will work with you on that same with the fat right yes. there's another high high value mm -hmm. item that people let slip away and that the butcher won't necessarily just give you mm -hmm. uh, unless you ask right and if you're buying an animal from somebody else and the rancher is facilitating the slaughter make sure you speak to the rancher about that too so mm -hmm. that the slaughter guy knows not to throw away your fat but to get those to the um the butcher yeah. to wrap for you the same thing with the offal yeah. that that all has to be communicated to the slaughter guy who's the guy who's actually handling those right. things and you want the inner fat mm -hmm. separated yes from any of the other leftover fat on the animal. Right. right? So, you use those differently. Right. So in a pig, that would be your leaf lard. Mm -hmm. On the inside is going to be around all the entrails. And that right. makes the best lard. That is, that is high quality. Very good. high quality. It's what you want for your pastry, what you want to put in cookies, anything like that. Um, your pie crust, that is what you want to be working with. So, but you want that separated out from the back fat on the mm -hmm. animal, yep. which you can still render down and use. It's just not as high quality. That's really good for roasting vegetables. Um, it's going to retain a lot more of the animal flavor to it. So a little bit more meaty. So if you're doing vegetables, that's great. If you're cooking meat in it, that's a wonderful thing. But then you have other non-food products. And then, your, yeah, and then you've got your, your soaps. Your tallow. Yeah, of course, some people make candles mm -hmm. out of it. You have all those yep. great things that you can do. I actually use the lard or the, usually the tallow because we mm -hmm. don't like the flavor of the tallow as much. So right. I'll use that on my boots, on my leather gloves, mm -hmm. yeah, as a leather conditioner. There's a lot of different uses for that fat. Absolutely. Uh, besides the cooking. But again, there's high value. You don't want to give away or throw away that value. Absolutely. Uh, a couple <laughs> other ones are the oxtails. People don't mm -hmm. know what to do. Oh, I don't want that. No, man, throw that in a soup. 
you know, good, good flavor there. Right. I'm trying to think of any other specialty cuts that some people don't. The bones. The bones I was going to get to. You have to ask for the bones. Ask for okay. the bones. Some butchers will give them to you. Some will charge you for them. Mm -hmm. They'll all give you a few. You should get a few soup bones, but a lot of times they're not going to give you all of them. They're all valuable. They're all valuable for soup stock. Mm -hmm. And if you have dogs, they're wonderful for the dogs, as is any of the other products, like if you don't get to using it, you mm -hmm. say, well, I'm going to try the heart or the tongue, and then you just don't get there that year, at least take it. It's good for the animals. It's Cats, you can cut animals, it up. Yeah. You can you can dry it. We've, we've made doggy treats. Oh, yeah. Have you seen it. how expensive those little yeah. liver dog treats are? You can make yeah. your own in the dehydrator, yep. and the dogs love them. Yeah. Our, our butcher will, for $10 a box, like a 30-pound box, he'll cut them all up into nice sizes that are either, they're good both for soup use. stock uh -huh. or for the animals. Yeah. Now some butchers will give you the larger bones, mm -hmm. non-cut up uh, for free, and that's great. They're a little big for the animals and they're too big for the stock pot, so it's worth an extra few dollars if you have to pay it to have them cut up into usable pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, our dogs have lived six, seven months out of the year just on the bones and all the pieces of fat and meat and cartilage and everything absolutely. on the bones. And been very, very healthy for it. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But you remind me, I want to go back to the lard mm -hmm. because if you're having the butcher take care of all your other stuff, have your butcher grind your fat if you're going to render it. It makes your oh, job yeah. so yep. much easier when you get to the worth kitchen. Worth paying a few extra bucks for Absolutely it. worth it because yeah. it just it, it makes it a lot easier once it hits the kitchen. And one of the other things they're going to ask you often is the thickness of your steaks, your roasts, uh, your packages, weight. And so you've kind of got to know how much meat your family is going to use in a meal right. in, in a cooking session. Um, do you want one pound packages of ground beef right. or do you want two pound two. packages? Not going to usually get much larger than two, two and a half for ground beef. Yeah, and um, oftentimes... I've, I've asked for five because we, <laughs> we can do four to five in a, in a meal that's made to have a few leftovers. Right. Um, and they won't usually do that. It's just too much to I package. feel like we've had a hard time getting less than uh, a pound also. Yeah, a pound's pretty standard. Yeah. And same with steaks. How do you like your steaks? You know, do you like them thin? Do you like them thick? That all depends on how you like to cook them, but they're going to ask mm -hmm. you those questions. So it's just something if you don't know, play with it. Start with about three quarters of an inch and play mm -hmm. with it. Same with roasts. You know, about what size. They can't guarantee you the exact size, but about what size do you want your roasts? What's going to feed your family? Yeah. Those are some of the things to think about. So, of course, once you get your meat home, you have another issue. Well, you better have a chest freezer ready. You better ready. have a freezer ready. Right, because or some freezer. Can, do you, off the top of your head, like a beef, what kind of space does that require um, freezer-wise? Can well, you put that in a big chest freezer? Beefs can vary. We usually are thinking of grass-fed animals here, finished animals, especially beef and lamb. Mm -hmm. So they're often on, on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, often hanging weight four or 500 pounds, sometimes okay. a little heavier for a beef. Uh, lamb can really vary in size depending on the on the um, breed. Yeah. So that's hard to say. But for a beef and a freezer, we can fit in a standard size chest freezer uh, that's about four foot long. Okay. We have one of those and several long ones. We can fit a, a whole beef usually in one of those. Okay. Um, a larger chest freezer, like a six footer, which is 21, 22 cubic square feet, I think, we can fit a beef and a couple lambs. Okay. Yeah. Real good. Yeah. Okay, and real quick, a tip from you, because I know you're really good at this. You're the one who organizes the freezers when the meat goes in. Mm -hmm. You get a whole beef, and you got to pack that thing into the freezer. <laughs> How do you put it in so that you don't end up with all steak at the top or all liver at the top? Like, what's the... What's well, the technique? There, there's a couple different strategies depending on where in the season we are and what's happening. First of all, I've gone to throwing all the little drawer tray things away. Gone. They're, away, they're the a waste things. of space. Okay. Now, we put up a lot of meat. We need to maximize every inch of space. Those mm -hmm. things are nice for moving things around to get to different things. So if you don't have to pack it full, they're great. Right. Again, depends on your usage. For me, I, we got to get rid of them because we're packing everything to the top. So mm -hmm. I try to either stack things vertically of like kind. Okay. Or I try to layer it, which is a little harder to the way you've communicated to me that you think you're going to want to be using it mm -hmm. or seasonality. You know, like a lot of times our, our, our leg of lamb, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't have very many, they go toward the bottom. 
for spring use because right. we're going to use those around Easter and in the spring. Mm -hmm. If we have extra, then I'll put some at the top. Right. So again, what you want to think about is how you're going to use the meat over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. You know, steaks are summertime, usually, mm -hmm. you know, summertime, fall. So uh, if you're butchering in the fall, you're probably going to put those steaks down near the bottom, at the bottom and sure. use your roasts and your burgers through winter time mm -hmm. and early spring and so on. But again, it really comes to how are you going to use it? Yeah. And having a little bit of strategy when you put it up there so that you don't have to dig to the bottom Absolutely. for something if possible. Good. And one last one okay. that I know is always a challenge. There's always leftovers that we've got to, that we haven't used up for one reason or another year. at the end of the year. And I'm going, honey, you got to clean up the freezer. We got more coming in. And I look in. in and I've got like two weeks of meals that all consist of the odd bits that I didn't use throughout the year. Right. Yeah. Sometimes right. a hard, an oxtail, mm -hmm. a random roast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so try to sprinkle those things in. Try to try to sprinkle them. Try to them use in. them throughout the year and don't get stuck with them all at the end. Um, because and, and if nothing they're else, really good for you. Make a survival soup. Make a survival soup. Just chop it up. Enough onions and garlic, and anything's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, we hope that has answered a lot of questions and helped you out. Mm -hmm. Feel free to throw any questions here, and when we do the next Q&A, mm -hmm. we'll um, try to answer some of those. It's a great subject. We really want to encourage you guys, if you can't raise your own meat, to uh, support a local producer mm -hmm. and buy a high-quality local meat for yourselves and, right. and jump into this process. It's, it's really exciting. It's really good value. And there's a lot of security because that that freezer or canning, which we didn't really talk about. But no, but canning we do meat, we yeah. do like to have some of that meat canned so mm -hmm. it's protected from electrical outages or any problems that we try to prevent, but it could happen. Right. Um, so that's another strategy there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a great way to know exactly what's in your meat and what isn't in your meat. Absolutely. When you know right where it came from, and you can talk to the person raising it. Yep. So, good. Do we know what we're going to talk about next Well, time? I think it's going to be a preserving to topic. We're oh, kind okay. of in preservation season here. That sounds so good. So, I'm not sure if we've nailed down the exact topic, but probably going to be in your court a little bit. Okay. Um, with uh, some sort so of preservation. So, if you have any big preserving topics you want to hear about, you better leave Drop it in the comments in now. below. Or, or <laughs> email we'll us. Check it. Right. Yeah, or email us. Or email us, Josh good. and Carolyn at homestandfamily.com. Take care, you guys. Goodbye. Goodbye.